as the cricket's soft autumn hum is to us, so are we to the trees, as are they to the rocks and the hills. Gary Snyder. We're here um, to discover, rediscover humility, senses of scale, um, and perspectives that that poem suggests. Um, welcome. So it's now my really great pleasure um, and honor to introduce our opening speaker, Robin Wall Kimmerer, um, who um, I'm honored to call my colleague and delighted to call my friend. Um, from, the, from the first when we began scheming this whole gathering, I knew that if, if we could work it out, I wanted Robin to be the opening speaker, and I'm so grateful that she's here with us tonight. More than any other person that I can think of, Robin um, has been able to articulate with, with the greatest authenticity um, the synthesis of, of Western scientific insight and indigenous insight and wisdom and braiding those together, uh, highlighting the best of both traditions. And, uh, and, and because of that deep insight and authenticity, I know that she speaks so deeply to so many people, and I've heard that from many of you here, that, that you're so excited to hear her tonight. Uh, Robin, uh, as many of you know, is an enrolled member of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation, but, and also um, has a PhD in plant ecology, and is, a, is an expert on the biology of mosses. Um, she is a distinguished teaching professor of environmental biology at uh, the State University of New York, uh, um, and the founding director there of the Center for Native Peoples and the Environment. Um, she also is the founder of the traditional ecological knowledge section of the Ecological Society of America, which has really brought a, a new depth to that professional organization. As many of you know, she's an award-winning author, um, two wonderful books, which will be out in the bookstore tomorrow, uh, Gathering Moss and Braiding Sweetgrass, uh, and there's so much more that I could say, but much better for you to hear from Robin. So please welcome Robin Wall Kimmerer. Bonjour. Shabadas ke gish ko kwe na deshna kas. Budwe wad mi kwe anda. Megaze do dem, min wa makoda dem, nin mami kwenda mampi ya yang. It is our traditional protocol greeting in Potawatomi language, which I don't speak very much of, but our elders tell us to breathe life into it and to share it with people as often as, as, as we can. And in our language, I told you that I'm a Potawatomi woman um, of the Bear Clan and also of the Eagles, and that I'm really glad to be with you today. I also want to echo the gratitude and acknowledgement for the privilege of being here in, in Yavapai territory and these homelands. And to when we think about our land acknowledgements, to also think about our relationship and our debt that we have. A debt of land, a debt of history, a, de a debt of language. And for the things that bring us together in this confluence, a debt of the philosophy, science, and culture of land care, of healing of, of people and of land. So all gratitude to the first peoples of, of this place. And also so much gratitude for the organizers of this confluence, this notion, yes, yeah, of bringing everybody together around the... And it's such a privilege to stand and talk to folks who have this shared knowing um, that the wellness of the land depends on our, that, that the wellness of people depends on the wellness of the land, that we are inextricably linked. And the fact that we get to have a few days together to imagine how we might support the mutual healing between land and culture that is, is needed. 
And um, as Tom said, I am a plant ecologist, and so um, I always look to the ecotones, and the, those, those blending places where, where two kinds of ecosystems meet, because they are the most diverse. They are the places where there's an awful lot of action. They are at the edges of um, ranges, and so the rates of evolution and change and, and generativity are greatest in those ecotones. And that's what we are creating together here, is an ecotone between these ways of knowing, and I'm really excited to be able to uh, explore that ecotone with all of you. I also want to say thanks to Tom for that nice introduction, but I feel that in all honesty, and given my topic this evening, I have to amend it just a little bit to say that I am not who you think I am. I am so much more. <laughs> Standing before you is also one billion microbial cells who are running my gut and therefore my brain. Um, about 3,000 invertebrates on my surface. It's okay, you can still sit next to me. Um, innumerable fungi to say nothing of the fact that every one of my cells and yours has been colonized by a symbiotic prokaryote who took up residence as a mitochondrion millions of years ago and has been with us animals ever since. My bones are not me, but the minerals from the soil and from my groundwater. My muscles are full of carbon on a short-term loan from corn. And the breath that oxygenates my blood and infuses my brain is the exhalation of trees. I am the dream of my ancestors, and I hope not to be the nightmare of my descendants. So thank you for those kind words, but I can't claim sole credit. This walking community who is named me is replicated in principle all over the earth, far outside the me and far outside the you of our own species. That white pine who stands by the lake doesn't stand alone. Key is inseparable from the mycorrhizal network, linking key to myriad others, to the nitrifying bacteria who nestle in the recesses of the needles, the bark beetles, the nuthatch, the symbiotic pine drops blooming at the base. The pine is no more an individual than I am. We are all part of the great green we. And this is a kind of ecological kinship, a functional relatedness that's rooted in our biogeochemical cycles of which all of us are a part. And of course, thanks to the extraordinary advances in molecular genetics, we also know that we share the vast majority of our DNA with other species. There is so much more that in our shared inheritance than there is distinctive. Our kinship is therefore genetic as well as ecological from a shared ancestry. But the kinship I want to talk about tonight and explore together in our time goes deeper than that. To really think about what binds us together as this walking community is reciprocity. The same relationships of give and take that keep the world in balance. And the principles of ecology are clear on this from our internal microbiome, which is embedded in us, to the biome, macrobiome, in which we are embedded. The community persists and flourishes only when there's reciprocity. If my microbiome is not in reciprocal balance, then I am not going to be well. If my water is contaminated, then I am contaminated. All flourishing is mutual. Every life connected to the next. You know this. That's why you're here. And I am unlikely to tell you anything tonight that you do not already know. But our elders and teachers always say to us, you know, we are human be beings. And so our job is to remember, to remember. To remember that when the land is well, we are well that when the land is sick, then we become sick. And we are. Despite each of us being a walking community composed of multitudes, there is an epidemic of loneliness plaguing our species. We are lonely for authentic engagement with each other, and we suffer from this deep estrangement from other beings on the planet, 
a phenomenon which has been called species loneliness. And in a state of species loneliness, we don't recognize our kinship with the more than human world. We, how can we then lean upon them for comfort? How can we benefit from intelligences not our own? And what if this species loneliness is reciprocated? What if the other beings are lonely for us too? For our respect, for our attention, for our gratitude? And what about when they need our help? What if they're calling to us and we are remaining silent? Conversely, we know that when we heal the earth, we heal ourselves. And collectively, I think before or maybe while we heal the earth, we have to heal ourselves from this illness of species loneliness to come back into this embrace of our more than human relatives. And together in this confluence where we find ourselves exploring, we envision that it might be possible, at least I envision, I hope you will envision with me, that we might think together of an antidote, a medicine for species loneliness. And I think that maybe one of the ingredients in that prescription might be kinship. And Tom asked if I might speak about the question of kinship and reciprocity, which really is at the center of a lot of my thinking and, and writing. And you know, one of my favorite images that one of my students gave me of the notion of kinship with the more than human world is actually one of those old time drawings of Noah's Ark. With you know, with the giraffes looking out and the zebras and the elephants and, and, and all, and they are looking back wistfully at the shore. And it, it said that that is a true kinship. <laughs> and a, a friend of mine on the Blackfeet Res, who is constantly asked to drive his family around all the time, finally put vanity plates on his van, and that read, you guessed it, kinship. <laughs> and the beings with whom I feel the greatest sense of kinship are my neighbors back home. I come to you from Maple Nation in upstate New York, where maples outnumber humans and carry the greater responsibilities of citizenship, what with making syrup and firewood and shade and soil and oxygen and picnics, to say nothing of sequestering carbon. Even now the maples are blazing with their messages of fall. And the shifting seasons are very loud in my ears this year. These are interesting times in which we live. And I don't know about you, but I don't always know how I feel. Especially on that warm October day when I'm still picking raspberries long after the first frost should have come. I can't decide whether I should enjoy their sweetness or swallow the bitterness that it portends. Do I revel in that guilty pleasure of shorts and sandals when I should be in flannel? I am as unsettled as my garden. I swing back and forth like our chaotic thermometer, trying to figure out whether I am readying my heart toward an, for an inevitable ending or turning it toward a beginning. And it's not just the temp temperatures. Children in cages, democracy at risk, corporations as people, age of the sixth extinction. Maple Nation is where I feel the greatest kinship, which translates to me to a sense of belonging. A belonging that goes both ways. I know them and they know me. Kinship is a covenant of reciprocity. And I know that I can rely on them and I want to say that they can rely on me, but can they? In that bigger we of the political, economic, cultural we that is so much bigger than each of us? And I wonder, will they ever be this bright again? Those lovers of a frosty night? I cherish them even more with the knowing that they may well be leaving us no, they're not leaving us. Let's be honest, they are being driven away, limping to the north as climate refugees, 
leaving only memories of scarlet hills. Is there an ark, a kinship for them? Each of you has your own story of loss, I know, of the fading of the green, of the Amazon on fire, wetlands dried up, grasslands drifting to desert, forests turned to pulp, parkland to parking lot, people impoverished by a lack of kinship to the barest thread of green. And it's important that we hold for a moment that grief and feel its power so we can make it work. What is the medicine for species loneliness? And I sometimes wonder whether we're making it harder than it needs to be. I wonder if we already know. Maybe we could start by asking what we might learn from how we respond to each other's human loneliness. We pay a visit, we bring soup, we sit together, we share a joke, we ask, what do you love? We ask, where does it hurt? and we listen to the answer. Could we learn to expand our circle of compassion from our own species to an encompassing ecological compassion that embraces our more than human kins? Ask them, what do you love? Ask them, where does it hurt? Species loneliness, I think, is a symptom of the disease of human exceptionalism. The notion that our species alone stands at the top of this biological hierarchy, the pinnacle of evolution, we are, after all, the chosen species, are we not? Fundamentally different and superior than all others and deserving of all of the riches of the earth, more than any of the other 200 million species with whom we share the planet. They say it is lonely at the top, what is a medicine that banishes this induced amnesia that makes us forget our relatives? I think that stories can be a kind of medicine. Stories could be one ingredient in the restorative tonic for, for, for forgetfulness. It feels to me as if we are living in mystic times when powerful forces hold us poised on the edge of a cliff with the potential for catastrophe or salvation hanging in the balance. And over and over there's this one story that keeps coming to my mind out of great antiquity. It's a story that has lasted for thousands of years. It's perhaps the oldest story that you will ever hear. It is ancient, it is urgent, and it invokes another kind of kinship more than ecological, more than genetic, a kinship of fates intertwined when worlds are transforming and we wonder which way will we fall. And this medicine was shared with me by Haudenosaunee elder Tom Porter while we were sitting at his table after breakfast at Ganajohalege when he pulled out a deerskin bag full of peach stones and he told me about the time when Sky Woman's grandsons, the twins, were in conflict over the future of the beautiful world. I asked Tom if I could share this story, and he kindly agreed. This is a small part of the Haudenosaunee creation story, which has some overlap with some of our Potawatomi tellings of the origin of the world. Perhaps you know the preamble to this story. It's a long saga, but perhaps you know the part about how Sky Woman fell to earth from her home in the sky world, how she was rescued in mid-air by the wild geese who set her to rest on the back of the snapping turtle, how the water beings brought up mud from the depths to make her a home on the back of the turtle, which she sowed with green and today we know as Turtle Island. You know how the good green earth was seeded from her hand and made by the gifts of the animals and the response of human gratitude the first time we were born into reciprocity. I don't have time for that part of the saga tonight, but perhaps you know also that when Sky Woman came down on that shaft of light from the sky world, she didn't come alone. She was pregnant with her daughter, Winona, 
the first child to be born on Turtle Island. And it's there where we pick up the thread of that story. Because when beautiful Winona grew to motherhood, she was not yet to motherhood, womanhood, the west wind sought her out, then motherhood. <laughs> she became pregnant with twin boys. And those two babies are known by their names, Flint and Sapling. And even in their mother's womb, those boys were in competition. It, they were twins. It was crowded in there. And Flint wanted to get free. And so Sapling counseled him, he had to bide his time, just wait, there's a natural way by which we will come into the world. But Flint was impatient and angry with his confinement, and so, as his flinty name implies, he decided to cut his way out of his mother's womb, rather than wait for the natural way. The result, of course, was the death of his mother, which he blamed on his brother. The two boys were orphaned, of course, and then raised by their grandmother, by Sky Woman herself, who did her best to guide them. The boys had the responsibility of shaping the new world on Turtle's back, and they went about it very differently according to their two natures. Sapling intended to make life really good for humans who were to follow. So he did things like make beautiful, delicious uh, blackberry thickets. But Flint came along and put thorns on every one of those so that in order to enjoy blackberries, you have to shed blood. Sapling knew that the rivers would become the highways for the people who were about to come. And so, so thoughtfully, he made the rivers run in both directions. But Flint, of course, came through and, and made them all go one way. So now we have to paddle home upstream. All the while, they were making and unmaking each other's contributions, even in our beloved maple trees. Sap Sapling gave the trees this gift of making sweet syrup. It came right out of the tree, thick and brown and sweet. But Flint thought that this was going to make the world far too easy for people, so he ran to the river and got bucket after bucket of water, which he poured into the top of the trees, so that today we have to boil the sap 40 to 1 to get to syrup. You see the pattern. These boys, however, are not characterized as good and evil twins, as you might imagine. That judgment is simply not made. They are known to represent opposing forces that are constantly at work in the world, the forces of creation and destruction. The boys struggled, they competed, they wrestles, wrestled, they did and undid each other's work, and eventually it was decided that the fate of the world had to be decided once and for all, and it was to be decided in a game. They would match their skills at what we call today and continue to play today, the peach stone game. And the players used a set of so-called stones. They were usually peach pits, and they were painted white on one side, and the other side was blackened. And they're put into a shallow bowl, and the player shakes the bowl with a wonderful sound, tossing the stones into the air. And when all the stones have turned one way or the other, only then is a winner declared. And the fate of life would be decided. If all the stones came up black, flint would prevail, and destruction would be loosed upon the world. Should they all fall white, then the world would continue under the generous hand of creation. They played, and they played, and they played without a winner. They tossed the seeds for hours back and forth, back and forth, and with every throw, two boys gambled with the future of the world. Would life continue, or would everything be lost? It's such an ancient story, and yet could not feel more contemporary, as today we gamble with the continuity of life. They played all night, on and on, until the glimmer of light at the eastern horizon warned them that their time was nearly up. There could be just one more throw. 
And as the pink dawn colored their faces, the last stones were thrown up into the air and began to clatter one by one into the bowl. The first one came up black, and the second, and the next, and the next. All the stones were black until there was only a single seed still hanging in the air, tumbling and spinning on its way to the bowl to join the others. All the other beings watched in terror as humans gambled with their lives. And at that moment when all life hung in the balance, it is said that all the members of creation, the trees, the berries, the grasses, the birds, the four-legged, the many-legged, and the no-legged, all drew in their breaths as the last stone tumbled, and together all of creation gave a mighty shout. Its force caused the human foolishness to be overruled, and the power of their voices turned that last stone over as it fell into the dish. The color of trillium blooming in spring, the color of mother's milk, of moonlit snow, the color of a polar bear. I've tried to imagine that sound, the roars, the panting, the swishing of grasses. In my imagination, I feel rather than hear their voices, large and small, chirps, hoots, buzzes, howls and flutters, scrapes, squeaks, leaf flutters, needle whispers, spine quivers, buds swelling, seeds bursting, roots pushing, spores popping, and the vibration of the membrane of the smallest microbe coalesced into a wailing wind, so cohesive in strength and direction that it stops the stone, spins it around, holds it poised in mid-air, and sets it down, life side up. What I love about the Mighty Shout story, among many things, is that it's not the humans who are in charge. They're not the ones who turn the stone, but all the others who are in solidarity with one single desire, to continue to be. Isn't that our most profound sense of kinship, having been given the gift of life and our longing for that life to go on. You know, that word relationship comes from the Latin to relate, to tell a story. To be in relationship means that we are connected by a story. And kinship is a special kind of relationship in which our ancestors, our bodies, our DNA, our ecology are part of the same story. And the mighty shout emanates from that kinship, this fundamental yearning for the evolutionary story to go on. Don't you wonder what it sounded like? I almost feel it in my chest, a force that makes things want to live. And I am longing to hear it, but even more than that, I want to know what it is. What is it that propels the mighty shout? In this mythic time, when life again hangs in the balance, when the world is on fire, I reach for that knowledge like a seedling reaching for light. I want a word. I want to use it like an incantation. If we knew the name of a force for ongoing life, could we call it forth? How strange the silences in our language, the things for which we have no words. And I couldn't find a word that worked in everyday English, so I turned to my faithful companion, scientific language, to biology. After all, biology must have a word for the life that propels all unfolding. And I found plenty of words for mechanisms, many descriptions of states, but the space in the glossary for the desire for life was blank. And I'm a student of my Potawatomi language, a language which is built on the grammar of animacy. And there are words for natural forces throughout. There's papoi, the force that causes mushrooms to push up from the ground overnight. 
There's a word for the force that causes flowers to open, which is different than the word for the force that causes buds to open. But as far as I could find no e expression for that animating force that propels the mighty shout. So I began asking people here and there who have access to ideas and vocabularies uh, that are not my own without result. And for most part, people I asked said, well, that's a really good question. Nobody had an answer. And far off from the paths that I usually walk, I met Sister Joan, a nun of the Sisters of Mercy and a scholar of religious thought. We walked among the gardens and on the salty shore and over broken pavement. And because her faith in humanity was much larger than my suspicion of religion, I entrusted her with my question. I thought perhaps her training on matters like resurrection had given her a word for a life force that my training as a scientist had not. She considered this seriously, but in all of her years of theological training, she said she had not encountered such a concept. But the next day, she came to me early and said, wait, I've been searching my memory, and yes, yes, there's something. Maybe not exactly what you're meaning, but perhaps a relative. She told me the story of the Abbess Hildegard von Bingen, who lived a thousand years ago. A brilliant woman, a cloistered religious, a mathematician, a composer, a natural scientist, a physician, and a writer. She would find herself right at home in this confluence. She too inhabited the ecotone of nature, psyche, and healing that we convene around. And I think that she too asked, what is the force that propels the life of the world? What is the source of our kinship? And the word that she made just felt to me like dew on the grass of my questions. And the word she made was viriditas. Viriditas from the Latin, literally meaning greenness, with the meaning of lushness, growth, verdure, and vitality. And it's not meant as a botanical term alone, but the force that greens the earth as the same force which generates physical health, spiritual health, and the wild vitality of nature. It means all of those things, not because of any ambiguity in her thinking, but because they're all the same thing. When I heard this word, I thought of the mighty shout. When I heard this word, I wanted to bring it here to you. Medical historian Victoria Sweet says that Hildegard used the word in the broadest sense, the power of plants to put forth leaves and fruits, as well as an analogous intrinsic power of all things to grow, to heal, and be healed. Veriditas, she thought, was the unifying force of nature, which propels all life, what Kim Stanley Robinson called the holy greening power, the driving force of the cosmos. Now, as a scientist, botanist, and writer solidly in what I would call the secular animist camp, I marvel at the, is there such a camp? <laughs> I, I marvel at the fact that I have become entranced with the 11th century thinking of a Christian mystic. And I find a surprising kinship with this woman whose life experience on the surface of things could not be more different than my own. But the more I learn, I can't help but think that she was listening for the mighty shout too, with ears tuned to maples in her homeland in the Rhine Valley. Pertinent to the theme of our confluence, she understood veriditas to be a metaphor for the motive force of reciprocal healing and kinship. And like the twins, Flint and Sapling, she understood that the life force of Eriditas was in tension with its opposing force, which she called Eriditas, a dryness which causes life to shrivel and fade. And Eriditas, she wrote, was fueled by injustice, because injustice impedes natural vitality with which all of us are endowed. What a contemporary concept from a thousand years ago. 
we can understand her viriditas at a planetary scale, so the Gaian breath of the world. We can understand it at the scale of a forest, an individual tree, the berries fruiting below the tree, and the person eating the berries are all connected by viriditas, the life force which is a source of kinship. When we nurture viriditas, we enact kinship with our more than human relatives. And then, Learning and thinking about her formulation of viriditas, I realized that in the Potawatomi language, we do have the right word. I didn't need to look any further than our word for plants. The Potawatomi word for plant, there isn't a word actually that just means like a green growing photosynthetic being. We, it doesn't mean that. The word that we have for a green growing thing is mushkakin. And mushkikin means medicine. All plants are called mushkikin. They're all called medicine. All plants are medicine for the land, for their relatives, and for us. But even that word medicine isn't quite right until you take the word apart into its components, where it literally means, mushkikin means the strength of the earth. And the word for medicine is not a noun. It's a verb. It's a verb that means he or she is healed by the strength of the earth. That's what medicine is. And we see its evidence everywhere that we look, in the annual greening, which is the breath of the earth, in wildflowers that come up in the ashes of a fire, salamanders dragging their bellies across the pavement to the pond, a tern flying 9,000 miles to lay eggs, a dandelion pushing up through the sidewalk, a stump apparently dead that sends up a shoot, the mother on chemotherapy, the force that wants to go on for the love of being alive. I wonder, was it a whisper of feriditas that turned the peach stone We could pause to remember that the forces embodied in those two young men, Flint and Sapling, the powers of making and unmaking, remember that those boys were twins, for those powers are inextricably linked. Creation in the natural world begets opportunities for destruction, and destruction clears the way for creativity. Those boys wrestled and rolled about in the dirt as the way that boys will do, making the world around them. The erupting volcano destroys the forest, blocks the river, and turns it into meadows and a new lake where a heron stalks. And in this time when life hangs in the balance and men are gambling with the future of the world, the forces of creation and destruction hold the stones in mid-fall. It is wise of us to ask before they clatter to the bottom of the bowl in our hands, what is it that needs to be destroyed so that creation can flourish? Some people think it's one species that needs to be deleted the plague of humanity that is threatening all others. The destructive power of humans is undeniable. But I'm not sure that it's humans that need to go extinct, but human exceptionalism. Before the industrial era, before the age of colonization, human beings lived in balance with the living world, with their relatives. Human practices and perceptions were guided by the laws of ecology the same laws to which every other being is subject. Our role in biodiversity was biocentric, indeed kin-centric, in the words of Enrique Salmon, understanding that we are linked and that we humans too have gifts and responsibilities to the world. And it was only an eye blink of time ago in human history, about 500 years ago, that we began this unwitting experiment incited perhaps by monotheistic religions who chased divinity from the earth up into the sky where we thought we would follow to our true home. And in that upward gaze of humanity, we lost sight of our kinfolks on earth. 
our mutual responsibility, our earthly gifts. We abandoned the notion of all my relations for a hierarchy of being in which humans are perched squarely at the pinnacle, just below the angels, with our sustainers beneath us, not there as family, but as servants or as property. In this experiment with human exceptionalism, we tested what would happen if we thought ourselves masters of the universe as opposed to the younger brothers of creation. And the results of that experiment are in. The two sides of the stones for me that will decide our future are human exceptionalism and its reverse kinship. If we hear the mighty shout and choose to remain silent, if we cannot be cured of human exceptionalism, then I believe we will suffer greatly and diminish the regenerative capacity of the lands around us. And I can easily imagine the world without us. Light will continue to stitch carbon together with infinite creativity into forms and flowers that we will never see. I have deep faith in photosynthesis. Veriditas will flow, finding new forms for its expression, and air and light will take forms we can't imagine, just the way that a moss couldn't imagine a redwood, and a redwood can't imagine a moss, whether we're going to be here to participate or not, which is not to say that we wouldn't be missed. If we choose kinship, then we can go on together if we also choose to practice the responsibilities that come with kinship. When I imagined joining in the mighty shout, somehow in my mind I thought it would be like the hallelujah chorus. But to my dismay, what arose from my throat when I tried to participate was a wail of anguish at the realization of what we have done. It was a great cry of shame, a howl of grief for the creation. And it surprised me and it scared me that my shout was a raging no and not a yes of encouragement for the rest of creation. It scared me deeply and then I understood the wisdom of it. It's understanding that grief is the measure of the depth of our love and that love is the material for transformation. Feeling the wounds of the world propels us. In this time, in order to say yes to creation, we also have to say no to destruction. We have to transform our grief to love, and out of the powerful love we have, raise our voices in the shout. We are growing in awareness of how nature heals us. The therapeutic benefits of participation in the living world, trends for a wide variety of practices that we're going to be sharing together this week, be it forest bathing, nature therapy, I'm eager and open to learn. I want to offer a story though of walking with my friend Jeff Greeno, who is a plant knowledge holder and healer at the Menominee Nation. We were teaching an ethnobotany class together, and I've walked through the woods with him many times with our students, and he points out the healing plants. The mutual aid society is among the trees and the fungi, and the students are absolutely entranced with his knowledge. He points out mycorrhizal fungi. He points out a vine that creates light gaps for seedlings, a root favored by bears, and a grass that carries fire. He calls them all medicines. The students' shyness crumbles and they ask more and more questions along the lines of what can I use that for? When do I pick it? How do I make it? And then gesturing at a shiny little inconspicuous vine, he doesn't answer them. And then he says, you know, there's tree medicine here, bear medicine, dragonfly medicine. Not all the medicine is for you. Yes, connection to nature can lower our blood pressure, regulate hormones, stabilize blood sugar, promote wound healing rates and improve metabolism. But can it cure us of thinking that nature is there just for us? Perhaps it can replace the anthropocentric worldview with the kin-centric worldview of reciprocal healing. 
not when we're asking what can nature give us, but what can we give her. That's when reciprocal healing begins. And as a gathering of healers, how can we harness our gifts to so the mighty shout can turn the stone and engender the cultural transformation that Joanna Macy speaks of so eloquently as the great turning, the shift from the industrialized and commodified view of the earth to a way of being that affirms life, affirms viriditas. I never thought about the great turning in this way. Is the great turning the turning of the stone? When we abandon human arrogance and acknowledge the intelligences other than our own, we open the door to adaptive solutions based on biomimicry. We could little, literally model a new society on the teachings of plants. The green world knows what to do with excess carbon in the atmosphere. Turn it into forests and prairies and kelp beds and soil. Who is it that knows how to purify air and clean up water? Who knows how to make it rain and make it beautiful? Who knows how to halt desertification and ocean acidification? Who knows how to cool cities and feed people? Who has already converted to 100% solar economy? <laughs> Who makes medicines and gives it away for free for bees and bears? Our green kinfolk, our plant teachers, to honor and restore Veriditas, how can we support our plant relatives in their work? We can't just take the healing powers of nature. We have to support the systems of mutual healing. We have to rebuild the hospitals whose names are forest and prairie and tundra. We can't just take the medicine. We have to be the medicine as scientists, as dancers, as artists, as teachers and farmers. Reciprocal healing needs restoration ecologists, hydrologists, conservation biologists, teachers, natural historians of every stripe. We need scientists of veriditas, scientists who will be able to tell us where does veriditas live, how might we use it. The highest concentration of viriditas, of the potential for healing in plants, lies in those perpetually embryonic tissues known as the meristems. And I just had a flashback of teaching general botany. Sorry about that. Um, those perpetually embryonic tissues, that shoot tips and, and, and root tips, those, those tissues that can reorganize themselves to be whatever is needed, roots, shoots, flowers, buds, whatever is needed for adaptation, meristems can make. And these meristems are growing points. There are apical meristems all over the plant. Every bud, every root trip has the intrinsic power of reciprocal healing. And by analogy with these plant meristems, we know about beautiful regenerative solutions sprouting all over the world. Communities of practice that are also buds and meristems, the, the, the power of, of adaptation. In all of the richness of the Mighty Shout story, there's one last detail that I cherish, that the game was played not with real stones or bones or shells, but with seeds, because seeds are the most powerful and potent of meristems. They are hermetically sealed parcels of life that can withstand ariditas in all its forms, winter, fire, drought, time, the secret of seeds is that they are vessels of veriditas. They carry the green fire through times of hardship and danger. The lessons of seeds are both physical and spiritual, that whatever is going to flourish in the future will be carried in a seed, the makers of continuity. Whatever you wish to see on the other side of this bottleneck of extinction and of climate change has to be carried through the narrows like a seed save the seeds, protect the seeds, pass them hand to hand. We do not make veriditas, but we can protect and nurture the conditions for its flow. Seeds tell us that we are not planning for the end. We are planting for the beginning. We humans have many tools for nurturing veriditas, and we have to remember that the word plant is not just a noun. Plant is also a verb 
and plant we must. Plant trees, plant a garden, plant your feet, plant a stake in the ground and say no, no further, no more loss. Reforestation, restoration is the art of reciprocal healing. Roll up our sleeves, get out the shovels, get out the seeds and get down on our knees. How do we serve Veriditas? How do we ally ourselves with the earth for reciprocal healing? Save the seeds, make the compost, learn the craft of gardening. But farmers everywhere who tend plants know there's one more step. First, we have to prepare the ground. We have to clear away that which would smother our new plants, crowd out our emerging seedlings, or poison the soil with their own needs at the expense of our seeds. Farmers have been using these techniques for millennia to rejuvenate, to start over. Sometimes using fire, carefully, strategically turning destruction to creation. What has to be destroyed for Veriditas to flourish is many human exceptionalism, extractive, extractive economies, income equality, land as property. You can make your own list. What we have to create is to carry the seeds of resurgence and fill our watering cans. In closing, I can say only for myself in these times of uncertainty that seeds have taught me. As I watch that last peach stone hang in the air, caught between the forces of creation and destruction, caught between despair and hope, I ask, what is my work in the world? I will add my voice to the mighty shout, and I commit myself that when that last seed falls, it will fall on good soil. Aho miigwech. so kind. Thank you. Thank you. So we say in, in our language when we talk about the future that we have to make together, there's a beautiful song that goes with that. Um, and the, the first line is, it is, Ambe, Majtara. And it means, come on, let's get going. <laughs>